The regularly scheduled program will not air at this time so that we may bring you the following special presentation. Parksdale Air Force Base, deep in the heart of the Arklatex, the home of the 917th Air Reserve Wing, the second bomb wing, and also the headquarters for the 8th Air Force. Ever since the 1930s, this base has played a major role here in the Arklatex, but also in world affairs. Ever since 9-11, national security has been our top priority nationwide, and the Department of Defense has been achieving its goals by deploying the assets of Barksdale Air Force Base as part of the 20th Air Expeditionary Wing, part of our defensive posture, because the best defense is a good offense. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward and freedom will be defended. KSLA TV presents Barksdale, ready to roll. Brought to you by Horseshoe Casino and Hotel. Hound, Emily, eighth, and... <laughs> This is the scene every morning since 1931, another day at Barksdale Air Force Base. A morning with B-52 bombing runs and tactical flight training in the A-10. The action is hot and heavy here. It hasn't stopped or even slowed down for months now, since the day the nation went into high gear. And you know, this all started on September 11th when President Bush actually landed here. Right. Which was Were you actually here? I was here actually talking to his airplane. It was a very exciting story. Uh, a very exciting story because they called us without notice and let us know that they were coming. And... Launching America's military into the highest state of alert, Barksdale had no idea as to whether this assault was over or just beginning. We still don't know. September 11th, they were taking no chances. Jersey barriers come out to slow down a possible terror attack on the ground. Full combat gear automatic weapons, guard dogs. If there's even the slightest suspicion, you don't get through. They're pretty tight today. They're real tight. Tight now you've seen them in 30 years. Lockdown is severe, but pictures from America's major cities confirm this is a necessary response. The people of Barksdale are already preparing for the next step. What goes through your mind when you realize this, this may be the day? I am angry, I'm hurt, I'm scared. And I'm afraid they're young troops that I've trained. Uh, their lives are going to be in jeopardy. And, and I think everybody in this country is in trouble right now. Security guards find what appears to be a bomb. They take care of it. It turns out to be nothing. But the president is on his way to Barksdale. Kia Baskerville, CBS producer, was on board Air Force One. The president is shaken. Once it, it appeared as once he got the word, um, you could tell that, uh, that it was... I don't know, that it really, it really got next to him. The crew here went into maximum overdrive. Since terror hit America, Barksdale Air Force Base has been in high gear. It's still in high gear. And Commanding General Kurt Badke is proud. And when tragedy struck, they reacted with flexibility and ingenuity. They quickly changed gears and focus and did the two most critical tasks that we required of them. First, to ensure the safety of our people and the protection of our resources. And secondly, they worked with sober resolve to make sure that we can remain ready to defend this nation if called upon. Despite a continued state of alert, the base has dropped its defense condition from Delta, the highest, to Charlie. Still tight, but a concession to the possibility of this military action lasting a while at what was arguably America's time of greatest need, Barksdale was there. It was an honor to, the, uh, to all of the men and women here. Uh, those who uh, uh, had a chance to uh, see him were very impressed. 
uh, both with his calm and uh, his sense of uh, resolve. Uh, we came away, I think, feeling uh, much more confident ourselves because of the uh, sense that uh, we got from him. General Badke says Barksdale will be ready should the president need them again. September 11th was a morning no one will ever forget. That's when communications coordinator Staff Sergeant Henry Coleman heard the phone ring. Actually, it was a, it was a frequency communication, radio communication on 311, which is our aircraft frequency. And it called an Air Force One, and I'm thinking it's a joke. Air Force One, Raymond 06, Air Force One, I'm like... It was no joke. But our, we spent uh, uh, a very short amount of time scrambling because uh, when I said, how soon are you going to be here, he, he replied, very soon. And no sooner than he said that. At about that point, I actually got a call on uh, my radio from uh, the ops group commander who said, uh, General, looks like we have Air Force One on short final. In moments, Lieutenant General Thomas Keck's office became the de facto White House. He was relaxed. He, he uh, very relaxed. As a matter of fact, sat down, was talking on the phone, and uh, just kind of took over uh, the office, which is his. At this desk, George Bush wrote what might become the most famous words of his presidency. Make no mistake, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. The many crews deployed from Barksdale have proven to be America's toughest foes against the forces believed to have been responsible for the acts of September 11th. The men and women of Barksdale say they're proud to serve in any way. The hub of power at that moment was here at Barksdale Air Force Base. It certainly was. For that hour and 52 minutes, uh, we were in the spotlight of the world. Since that morning, most of the units here at Barksdale have been in constant rotation, practicing the whole time. This morning's run is a short one, just a couple of hours. We take you now into the 917th Reserve Wing, where one of the most experienced crews in the United States Air Force is preparing for another day's run. Today we weigh about 338,000 pounds, and uh, we're going to eat up about 4,700 foot of takeoff run, uh, runway. This single crew, pilot, co-pilot, navigator, Electronic warfare specialist and bombardier has 15 to 17,000 hours of flight time. The experience of three wars, the Gulf, Bosnia, and now Afghanistan. Well, it's like anything, it gets better with age. You know, the more you know, the longer you've been doing this, it seems that uh, uh, it just becomes more a part of you. You don't have to think about what you need to do. It's ingrained in you. And yet, these reservists will practice once more. Three of the five have just returned from the front, putting their training to use. Today we're going to be practicing joint directed attack munitions, a JDAM, which is a precision weapon, um, and we've had a lot of good experience with it during the war. The latest in high-tech aerial warfare. This is what the JDAM looks like from the ground. Pinpoint accuracy deployed from a 50-year-old weapon, one of Barksdale's B-52s. When we come back, the crew gives the Stratofortress Renegade one last pre-flight check, and we take a look at one amazing success record. Did you know Barksdale Air Force Base was named after Lieutenant Eugene Hoy Barksdale, a test pilot who died in a crash in 1926? in service to its country since the Korean War. From a conventional bomber to a tactical weapon responding with alarming accuracy to ground signals and satellite input, this machine is once again responding to the call. Today's navigator, Major Bruce Guti, just came back from Afghanistan. He knows this bomb bay intimately. I clear this bay in about two seconds or less. Actually, if I go rapid, I clear it less than 
One last sweep of the giant jet and its systems. It's time to bid the ground goodbye. The B-52 success record in Afghanistan has been statistically astounding. A flood of emotions comes with this homecoming. Love, joy, and more than a little relief. For nearly four months, these have been arguably the busiest men and women on the planet. In the uh, first 95 days of uh, Operation Enduring Freedom, uh, the Air Force has uh, flown about 9,800 sorties. Uh, the bombers flew about 23% of those sorties and dropped about 75% of the weapons. A staggering percentage. General Bedke says 75% of all the bombs dropped this mission have been precision guided munitions. He says the B-52 has matured from a carpet bomber to a nearly tactical assault weapon capable of hitting pinpoint targets. This increased capability has turned up the heat on America's enemies and boosted the workload on our bomber units, and that includes the maintenance crews. You were hustling. Yes, sir. Uh, we were working hard. Um, my guys, especially on night shift, uh, during the height of the war, uh, every, every second was taken up, and we're on 12-hour shifts, usually end up being about 14 hours or so. We'd work in at night, and uh, those guys, uh, I couldn't be more proud of the work they did. Back on home turf, the men and women of Operation Enduring Freedom are looking forward to some hard-earned leave. You have no guarantee how long you'll be back home. Not a clue. What this goes way. through your mind? You're just going to enjoy the time that you have? Yes. That's right. The commanding general of 8th Air Force says the men and women of Barksdale have much to be proud of. You have rewritten air power history once again and made a statement for long-range aviation. We are proud of you. Barksdale's history as a major influence here in the Arklatex goes back much farther than the most recent conflicts, bringing much needed jobs to the Arklatex back in the 1920s and 30s. Barksdale Airfield has seen air power go from shellacked biplanes and silken dirigibles to today's modern wonders. Talk about an airfield here all started just before the stock market crashed. The dream almost didn't become a reality, at least not around here. But thanks to Air Reserve Officer Conway Allen, a small army of advocates, and a lot of political wrangling, in 1933, a 22,000-acre spread of Bossier Parish became Barksdale Field. All the construction at that time supplied jobs to 1,250 men and 350 mules. By the end of the 30s, Barksdale was home to the 3rd Attack Group and the 20th Pursuit Group. Then came World War II. I have complete confidence that the soldiers, sailors, and airmen, and all the civil population of the United Nations will demonstrate once and for all that an aroused democracy is the most formidable fighting machine. Generation of new plane took to the air here. Training at Barksdale became one of the war's top priorities. We uh, trained on the B on the um, Norden bomb site, which was classified top secret at the time. We dropped our practice bombs from the B-18A, mostly, and our bombing ranges were right out here on the east side of Barksdale Field. The Japanese bombed an obscure Hawaiian harbor. Three months later, Jimmy Doolittle and his raiders bombed Tokyo. Eleven of those raiders were trained here at Barksdale. Historians generally acknowledge that 8th Air Force was the uh, principal architect of the victory in Europe uh, for World War II. I mean, its bombs paved the way for the Army to do whatever it did, uh, you know, in actually conquering Germany. Through the years, the planes have changed from biplanes to jets. The unit's numbers have all changed, but the overall mission remains the same some four uh, million people that have served in, in 8th Air Force at one point or another, uh, but in fact, uh, their courage, their tenacity, and their bravery has set the course for us from World War II. When we come back, the mighty 8th Air Force attempts to shake off the effects of last month's fire, and uh, we'll also check in to see how bombing training is doing. Did you know back in the 1960s and 70s, 
Barksdale was also an intercontinental missile base, home to the Atlas rocket and later the Minuteman. virtually around the clock as the mighty 8th Air Force attempts to rise from the ashes of last month's fire. While the upper floors burned, the lower floors were inundated, and that includes the vault that holds much of the memory of this base. This is the 8th Air Force's new nerve center, at least one of them. Uh, this is where the logistics cell is going to be for right now. Logistics. Uh, what is right. logistics well, as far as this is concerned? Well, as far as it's concerned, we have specialties in logistics like supply, civil engineer, medical, um, logistics plans, CE. Those are logistics. All of that is going on here? Yes. Last month's fire has displaced more than 300 workers, workers who coordinate every move in the 8th Air Force. That's 53,000 airmen. This is what the old headquarters looked like just after the fire. Uh, we had some rough luck. They kept getting by the firewalls, the fire did, and we finally made the stop uh, uh, down to the southern end of the building. Inspectors put the price tag in the millions, and that's in electronics equipment alone. From one end of the building to the other, the fire ripped through the roof in the third floor, doing extensive damage. Then smoke and water did it to the rest of the building, and that includes the historical archives in the basement. But that's not the only historical part of this building. A little more than six months ago, the President of the United States launched his assault against terrorism from here. You've been back in the building. You've uh, been in your historic office, as it were. How did it fare? I, I, the first thing I did when I returned uh, last night, uh, it was dark, but uh, we went in with flashlights and the fire chief, uh, and we looked around, and uh, I was surprised. I had expected much more damage. Uh, what I found was a lot of water, a lot of water dripping, uh, but in fact, the fire was really uh, primarily in the roof. Largely sparing a chapter of Barksdale history. Now, crews here are focusing on the present. In times like this, people band together and they pull together, and uh, ironically, morale improves uh, in a condition like this, where we're all pulling together, we're all part of the same team, as we always are, but particularly in times like this. With in-air refueling, the B-52 can fly around the world without ever stopping. Today's theoretical run is just down to the Gulf and then loop back up to Alexandria, Louisiana, where we'll lay down some theoretical bombs. Each crew member, however, takes this mission just as seriously as any sortie over Afghanistan. Eight giant jet engines keep up their deafening roar. The five-member crew is maintaining its edge Today's sortie is half a world away from this crew's last business run. Low-key navigator Bruce Guti is still pumped. Have you been over to the forward front yet? Oh, yes. Yeah, I was in Desert Storm, and then I did uh, 20 missions uh, over Afghanistan. What was it like? It was pretty exciting. It was new and different for us in a lot of ways. Uh, we changed the role of the BC-2 quite a bit. Flying anywhere from 10,000 to 40,000 feet above the ground when in Afghanistan. This run, the crew stays in the lower altitudes. No enemies here. Nonetheless, electronic warfare expert Major Mark Alvarez deploys his flares and chaff, protection against any ground fire. I try to keep these guys out of trouble while they're doing their business. They're always wanting to go into harm's way, and I try to keep harm from coming to them. Every day in the air over Louisiana, these stratofortresses wheel and maneuver. Some crewed by reservists, others by regulars, all of them in the service of their country. Our, uh, our reserve squadron continually flies with the active duty squadrons here. We fly together, we mix airplanes, we mix crews, so that we all have the same standards, and now it's paying great dividends as we go fight the war. The crew has passed all its tests for the day. The B-52 Renegade drones back towards Barksdale. On any given day, this crew of reservists may take off and not land again until it's on the other side of the world. This time it seems like we got right in the fray right at the beginning in the, uh, in the action. City of 4C TDY coming your way? Yeah, I imagine uh, it's just a matter of time everyone's going to get their chance. When we
we come back, we'll take you back down to the flight line for a type of training that's completely different from this one. And we'll also give you a glimpse at the continuing quest for security at Barksdale Air Force Base. Did you know 8th Air Force Commanding General Thomas Keck is following in his father's footsteps? Major General James Keck commanded at Barksdale back in the early 1970s. Barksdale is home to a lot more than just bombers. Any given afternoon, you can see the A-10 Thunderbolt cutting across the skies here in the Arklatex. The 917th Reserve Wing has a school here for pilots active and reserve in tactical maneuvers. This is close air support for ground troops. Captain Bob Fair dons his flight suit for today's high pressure lesson. Actually, it's a G suit. So what it does, connect this to the jet Anytime you pull over, I think four Gs it is, it'll blow up and that way the blood doesn't get stuck in your leg and you don't pass out. Fair is not learning how to pilot the Arkla, Texas staple, the Strato Fortress. Today's lesson plan? We're going to be practicing on medium altitude, high altitude dive bombs, dive bombs as well as some high altitude strafe. Learning to pilot this, the A-10, also known as the Warthog, a subsonic jet that's heavily armored. A single pilot, highly maneuverable, twin-engine jet plane. Four of them just arrived in Afghanistan, and here's why Allied forces are overjoyed. It's a ground attack fighter plane, and it uh, is capable of carrying a lot of different kinds of ordnance or munitions. Of course, any type of bomb can be carried by the airplane. Making it a potent threat to anything on the ground, and a variety of missiles, Maverick and Sidewinders, make it deadly to armor and other fighter jets. And then that's all leading up to the fact that we have this cannon on the airplane, which is uh, the most powerful gun that's ever been mounted on an aircraft. It shoots 65 rounds per second. The pilots trained here will soon be applying today's lessons in Afghanistan and wherever Enduring Freedom turns next. The morning of September 11th, security at Barksdale went through the roof. Jersey barriers were immediately thrown up. Now more permanent structures have been erected. Not since the days of the Cuban Missile Crisis have things at the base been this tight. The guards are on point. Cars are searched from every angle. Security is tight here at Barksdale. And if you're planning a civilian event here, like a wedding or a party, it just got tighter. One of the prerequisites is that we be provided with a list of the individuals if they don't have authorized recurring access to the installation at least 72 hours in advance. It gives us an opportunity to validate the list and to determine if there's any concerns or problems. The base is often used for a host of civilian events completely unrelated to anything military. The local Scottish society has its annual fling at the base each year. And what we do is we have a flair for the Scottish heritage. Uh, we have music and dance, and we tell traditional stories. And we've been very fortunate to be able to do it at Barksdale because it's such a beautiful facility. The Highlanders' party went off without a hitch, but only after a guest list was submitted. The leaders here at the Air Force Base say they're not trying to discourage civilians from enjoying themselves on Barksdale. They just want to plan ahead. Because that's principally what we're here to do is serve and protect. We, uh, in turn, ask for the allowance and support of our community to ensure that we're able to do that because the mission that we have to perform is, is very vital to our national security. Scottish society says it understands. Colonel Joe Lovett says he hopes everyone is just as understanding. When we come back, Barksdale Air Force Base takes on an international importance when it comes to strategic planning. And also, the B-52, how much longer will it stay in the pipeline? You may be amazed. Did you know that 54 different commands took part in the air war over Afghanistan? And leaders from Barksdale were major contributors to the coordination.
Scottsdale Air Force Base each year becomes the hub of strategic planning, not just nationally, but internationally. Hundreds of service members from countries all over the globe come here to Barksdale Air Force Base for Operation Blue Flag. Coordinators say it's events like this that make sure that we stay on top of the war against terrorism. Nearly two miles of razor wire surround tents and generators, cables, communications gear, and some of the finest strategic minds in the world. Right now, these international strategists are learning to do more than simply work side by side. They're learning to win together. We get along great. We've got Army guys, we've got Navy guys, we've got our, our folks from Australia and, uh, and the other Commonwealth countries here all playing with us in this particular exercise doing great training for when we actually have to go employ our. One of the International Coalition members, Group Captain Ted Prinzel, flew all the way around the globe just to sort things out. We have a lot of similar equipment, we have a lot of sim similar tactics and procedures and techniques, um, but putting it together in training exercises is, uh, the actual flying is the uh, end result of this activity. Here we're trying to coordinate all the operational level coordination so that the flyers, the fighters on the ground or in the air can actually put it together properly. Working out all the bugs and doing it on a grand level. Simulating an active war from intelligence to the final assignment of firepower. Doing it with fellow service members from other branches who have never worked together before. Well, they develop a target, uh, they pass that over to our target shop, which sits over here. The target shop says, okay, I, I know where I want to hit, uh, but what exact point and what effect do I want to get from, from the strike on that area? If I... This room represents the next wave of America's war on terror. Despite the fact that this year's Operation Blue Flag could only attract 500 as opposed to 700 officers and enlisted men, they believe this operation will pay off because in the next few months, these same people may soon be working together in a war zone. The fact of the matter is that a large proportion of these folks will probably go ahead and deploy in the very near future to replace some of the folks that are already staged forward into, into some of our forward areas in the fight of terrorism. The B-52 will be a presence here at Barksdale Air Force Base for many years to come. Congress just initiated a program to upgrade these for the next 30 years. At first it raised some eyebrows because the plane's already 50 years old. But since its success in Afghanistan, many of those wrinkled brows have been smoothed. The B-52 bomber is spending its golden anniversary in active combat. For 30 of those years, Colonel Dave Lay piloted one. He calls the B-52's service record unprecedented. Well, if you think back, that would have put the Wright Brothers airplane out of business in about 1953, <laughs> uh, which says a great deal for the airplane. <clears throat> it's a very capable weapon system. The updates uh, to the aircraft uh, have kept pace with technology. The museum at Barksdale Air Force Base is packed with examples of the Stratofortress and its numerous missions. The B-52 is a lot more than just a 50-year-old piece of our history. It's a very important part of America's arsenal in Central Asia, and there are crews on the ground here at Barksdale just raring to go. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, when called upon, I'll go. You know, uh, don't know when that'll be, but uh, I'll do what's necessary, what's, what's asked of me. The crews say the age of the plane does not daunt them. In fact, they say it's reassuring. And it looks like the 50-year-old mainstay will continue to reassure well into its 70s. Number one, there was $70 million in the defense appropriations bill to upgrade uh, the B-52. As you know, the B-52 is scheduled to be in the Air Force's arsenal for the next 25 years. And a lot of people wonder how such an old aircraft is going to hold up for that long a period of time. One way is to continually upgrade the aircraft. When word first started coming back from the front, the statistics were incredible. Barksdale's planes were scoring success after success. The crews in the air over Afghanistan were understandably proud, but they weren't claiming the victories alone. They were passing on the laurels to the maintainers right here in the Arklatex. Maintainers are hard at work. These giants are America's muscle in the war against terror. General Kurt Bedke 
just came back from the front. They miss their loved ones sure. and they want to come home and uh, be with their families, their wives, uh, husbands in some cases, mm -hmm. and uh, their kids. This time, he was just an observer. Is it strange watching your crews responding to someone else's suggestions as far as jumping through hoops? Uh, no, not really, because we're used to uh, taking the crews and sending them over to a theater and saying, okay, the theater now owns those crews. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not surprising at all. Uh, mostly it's gratifying to know that they're doing such a great job. General Bedke says a large amount of the success is due to the crews right here, the maintainers, ensuring each giant plane is in impeccable shape. What do you listen for? It is for rattling and loosening of the skin. We want to make sure that's not separated. We want to make sure that the rivet's not pulled through the skin so it stays uh, intact. And you think there might be a problem right there? Possibly. There's a little, little shaking in the skin. These crews at Barksdale are leaving nothing to chance, and the statistics out of Afghanistan are starting to prove that. The maintainers uh, have been, done an incredible job, in fact, uh, of uh, 200 attempts to get off the ground uh, in B-52s, uh, we have managed to launch 198. That's phenomenal. Those. That's incredible, a 99% launch rate. Uh, just doing a superb job. Bedke says while his teams miss home, they're proud of the mission they're accomplishing. Barksdale is also the home of many ground units as well. Just how ready is our base for non-conventional warfare? Well, we'll tell you, coming up. Did you know most forms of powdered anthrax are actually beige to brown in color? The security we once took for granted is no more. New York and Washington face direct assaults. What are we doing here in the Arklatex to ensure we don't face a similar fate? Here's what. Nuclear, biological, and chemical terror are now a reality in America, and the Arklatex is responding. Airtight masks are donned. Non-porous hoods go up. Every seam is sealed. The team from Barksdale is now prepared to enter the hot zone. Today's exercises, nuclear detection, Send in the Gamma guy first and any other guys behind because Gamma guy radiation is the, uh, is the most deadly. And bioterror anthrax testing. What are you ready for? Uh, all of our NBC troops are ready for the full spectrum of uh, threats against this base and as well as the local community. Exactly what that full spectrum is, is almost anyone's guess. Since last September, America's capital has come under direct biological assault. For a while, the country's postal service became the battle zone. Then the nation's crop dusters came under suspicion. Unlike any war since 1812, suddenly America was vulnerable. I think that was a lot of the consensus of the general public was it could never happen to us. Like every other emergency management agency nationwide, the Caddo Bossier Office of Emergency Preparedness had to swing into high gear. Gathering together emergency resources for miles around, the military will play a major role in our response to weapons of mass destruction. The Department of Defense has millions of dollars of technology at their disposal. You know, they have the special detection equipment and decontamination equipment. And you know, for a city to be able to have their capability would just, I mean, it cost millions of dollars. So, in accordance with mutual aid agreements written years ago, long before 9-11, the weapons of mass destruction team continues to prepare. Because of the recent deployments, many of the team members are reservists called back to active duty. They swap for possible biological agents and scan for traces of nuclear radiation. Now this type of team is nothing new to Barksdale. Ever since the first weapons of mass destruction, say nuclear bombs, were invented, this base has had this kind of team. It's just that our awareness has increased since last fall something that weapons of mass destruction experts treat with mixed emotions. I'm here to tell you there's no difference in our threat today than there was on September 10th. It's just now everyone is now a lot more aware, which is a good thing. It's a shame that, that something like that had to happen for, that, for us to become more aware of what we needed to do. The nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons experts of the Arklatex say they've always taken it seriously and have no intention of stopping anytime soon. 
in light of today's realities. The chairperson of the Senate's Emerging Threats Subcommittee saluted the men and women of Barksdale Air Force Base. In recent months, Senator Mary Landrieu has become one of the most important leaders in Washington. Since September 11th, the men and women of Barksdale Air Force Base have played a major role in America's response to terror. U.S. Senator Mary Landrieu says she backs them 100 percent. She went to New York and saw the terror firsthand. It is just beyond anything the civilized world can tolerate, and we will not. Senator Landro is actually one of the few people who can say that and mean she's actually going to do something about it. Through a twist of fate, the Louisiana Democrat is in a position in the Senate that could help America determine the way it approaches this war. She's the uh, chair of the Emerging Threat Subcommittee of the United States Senate Armed Services Committee, which directly deals with terrorism and counterterrorism measures. In the next several weeks, her committee will be dealing with things like bioterrorism, chemical uh, weapons of mass destruction, as well as nuclear and other asymmetrical threats. The junior senator from Louisiana is a critical link in Barksdale's mission to hunt down America's most elusive enemies. We know where a lot of them are, I want to say that. We know where a lot of them are, and, uh, and we will find them all over the course of time, maybe in a few weeks, maybe a few months, maybe it will take us a few years. But they will be found, they will be rooted out, and those terrorist cells will be destroyed. With the help of Barksdale Air Force Base and the rest of the nation's military, Landrieu says America will put an end to terrorism. When we come back, Enduring Freedom continues with no end in sight. What will the ongoing mission of the reservists here in the Arklatex be? And what kind of role will their civilian employers play in this patriotic appeal? Did you know each B-52 can carry up to 20 air-launched cruise missiles? Operation Enduring Freedom is a large one. And that's where the reservists, the men and women of the Arklatex, people who as civilians are law enforcers and firefighters and many other jobs come in. This is a big operation and it's gonna take a lot of time. Torrance Bedford, emergency medical technician and Air Force reservist is one of them. Just like with the fire department, you know, every situation is different and when it, when it bell goes off, you know, that, that emotion is different from what you actually think, you know, is going to take place. Bedford is one of hundreds, perhaps thousands, of local emergency workers awaiting military orders. Around the Arklatex, each police force, fire department, and sheriff's office is reporting a 10 to 15 percent reservist rate. Uh, and I can tell you that, uh, you know, even in reviewing the application process when we're looking for people to hire, that uh, those military people make, uh, make great employees. Now, these great employees will have to leave their present posts for other assignments, leaving some staffing challenges back here in the States. We've had two that have been called up already. One is in canine and one is one of our special operations folks. So, uh, so it impacts us in small units to take one out. It really impacts us there. In the jail, for instance, we have 16. Uh, 16 deputies, corrections deputies, taken out of the jail will impact us tremendously. And in the long run, the activation could create more than mere staffing problems. Before all this started up, homeowners in Shreveport had a class one category when it came to fire protection. Now will this staffing shortfall impact your wallet when it comes to paying your insurance next year? The citizens uh, should have no worry about uh, us trying to maintain the same level of performance and quality service that they've come to expect. Um, with these individuals being called up, uh, we'll maintain the, uh, the same staffing levels. Sleeping mat. America's first Marine Reserve unit to be activated came from right here in the Arklatex and left out of Barksdale. Company B of the 1st Battalion, 23rd Marines, is now on the ground in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, guarding Al-Qaeda detainees. They took off from Barksdale Air Force Base. We were there as the C-141 troop transport took off. In the hours before dawn, the Marines of Bravo Company file onto a bus. Their only luggage combat gear. The next time their feet hit the ground, 
it'll be in Cuba, an active war zone. Uh, they're going to be uh, taking over for all the security for Guantanamo Bay. They're going to walk the post, uh, man the post, uh, special reactions. Uh, they're training for uh, anti-terrorism, uh, just everything it takes to keep that uh, installation safe. Then it's on to a C-141. These are the first Marine Reservists to be activated since the terror attack of September 11th. They go to Cuba to fill in for the active duty units usually tasked with guarding the American naval installation there. Traditionally, one of the Marine Corps' toughest assignments. I, th I just think it's a, a lot of them realize how, how much of an, uh, an effect they'd be making while they're not going necessarily to Afghanistan, just the fact they're participating in something that's been a part of the military history for so long uh, still shows the importance of what they're doing. It's only a four-hour flight from Barksdale to Guantanamo, but it's a world away. Whether it's a matter of months or years, the leaders of these young warriors say the Marines of the Arklatex are proud to serve for however long it takes. This mission is no exercise. The guys they're going to be looking at on the other side of the fence are not fake. No, uh, they're not fake, but uh, either are the Marines. Uh, they've trained, they're prepared for this, and uh, they're ready to go. Despite the incredible accuracy of the newest generation of bombs, war is not without a price tag. In December, it's believed B-52 ordnance hit and killed three U.S. soldiers in Afghanistan. One possibility is that the wrong coordinates were entered into the targeting system. Experienced bomber pilots say the situation will be investigated. Every one of us wanted to come home from Vietnam as soon as possible. Retired General Peyton Cole knows that price. He flew more than 400 bombing sorties over Vietnam. He lived with the fear of bombing friendlies every day. Once you release that ordinance, you don't know exactly where it will end up once it explodes. And so uh, many times uh, you put not only yourself but your friendlies uh, at risk. Cole says shrapnel has no conscience. Senator Mary Landro of Louisiana has followed the incident. Our special operations forces evidently got out ahead of the bombers coming in to try to bomb some of the um, areas where we're hoping to identify and, uh, and capture bin Laden. And unfortunately, several of our um, soldiers uh, were killed and others wounded. So we, uh, the incident is now under investigation. Step by step, what happens next? Well, most certainly this is going to uh, cause there to be an evaluation of what happened on that particular flight. But uh, as far as the overall campaign, I don't think that is going to affect it. Now, that's my opinion. The B-52 has been serving its country for the past 50 years now, and veterans say there is one hard-earned lesson that doesn't change. In a war, there is no such thing as friendly fire. It's like doing something to a brother. And it's the worst feeling in the whole world. General Jack Ely says so far, civilian employers have proven their patriotism by graciously accepting the activations of hundreds of Arklatex service members. He says it's not known how long the activations will continue. And uh, we ask a lot from those civilian employers to give up an employee for a year or two, depending on how long the uh, activation is. So it really puts a strain on them. This is a long haul, though. Well, this is going to be a long, uh, long war, and uh, we're just in the very early stages of it, and uh, it, it's going to be tough on the employers. When we come back, we'll sit down with a major player in the first phase of the war against terror and find out what role the assets at Barksdale will play in the future. Did you know while the military comprises only about one half of one percent of all the U.S. population, the 8th Air Force alone has 53,000 dependent families.
Scottsdale Air Force Base continues to charge ahead in Operation Enduring Freedom. Many of the tools of war and the men and women who were part of the first wave have now returned to recharge their batteries. But don't worry, there's a second wave that's already gone over in rotation. On the flight line, the B-52 jet engines scream to life. Virtually round the clock since the day the president spoke from Barksdale, these bombers have been proving their stuff. The Colonel Tony Iamondi just came back from the front. And in fact, we were gone on the 21st of September, so 10 days after the president landed here, this unit packed up and was moving 10,000 miles away, and within three days, we were ready for war, and on the 7th of October, we launched the first missions. Iamondi says the 28th Air Expeditionary Wing was made up of 54 units from all over the world, a coordinated effort beyond anything the military seen in a generation. Iamondi says that effort is far from over, so the work here never ends. Where are we? What is this? This is uh, Hangar 1, which is building 6604. Uh, we do the uh, phase inspection on the, the uh, bomber aircraft that we have here on Barksdale. What you working on right now? Uh, this is a B-52 we've got from the uh, active duty side. Since 9-11, the maintenance schedule here has more than quadrupled. A week to 10 days is the most this plane will stay on the ground here at Barksdale, and then it's right back up in the air, doing anything the president wants it to do. So, it was great so for the time the being, really newly returned vice commander, Colonel Iamundi, really reacquaints so. himself with his home right. base and stays ready to respond to the call. The first phase of the war is kind of over where we went in and with massive firepower. Now we're shifting to hunting and finding and, and, and striking where we need to find. And of course the next phase could take us anywhere we don't even know where that is. Just where it will lead is anyone's guess. But the commanders here say they will be ready to serve in whatever capacity they are tasked. They say Barksdale has modified and changed many times through the year. They say the regulars and reservists out of Barksdale will continue to keep this country safe and its enemies on the run. The resolve of our great nation is being tested. But make no mistake, we will show the world that we will pass this test. Too long, our culture has said, if it feels good, do it. Now America's embracing a new ethic and a new creed. Let's roll. Dale, ready to roll, has been brought to you by Horseshoe Casino and Hotel.